I'm Robert Cavuto, and today on Sonic Perspectives, we are speaking with Pete, with Pete Evick, guitarist for the Brett Michaels Band, to talk about the release of his new book, MTV Famous. Welcome, <laughs> Pete. Perfect shirt for the interview. Yes, yes. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Always a pleasure. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Know, you. I always say it's it's when someone when someone asks me to do something once, it's it's an honor, but getting to return, and this is my third time, yeah. technically. You know, so that 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 makes us real friends now. <laughs> that is, that is. And I just want to, before we got into the book, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, my wife and I really enjoyed the show at Party Gras. We came to see you out in PA. It was tremendous. I mean, yeah, yeah. really a lot of fun, high energy, all the bands and, you know, all the singers that came out with you and Brett, fantastic mm -hmm. show. It, it, it was an interesting take, right? I mean, it was, you know, Live Nation took a chance with Brett's idea. They weren't quite sure. I, I, you know, I even, I remember all the meetings and Brett has talked about doing that party girl thing. And originally he wanted no opening acts. He wanted the whole thing to be three and a half hours yeah. of party girl guests like that. Like, oh, and Live Nation didn't quite understand that. So they're like, we'll meet you in the middle. We'll put a couple of openers on the spot and let you do the party girl with your set. And I remember none of them quite understood. Nobody understood it until opening night in Detroit and all the management teams and all Live Nation reps and everybody were there. And they saw it with their own eyes. They're like, oh, oh, this is super cool. And they understood all of a sudden, you know. They got it. Yeah. And, and Night Ranger was fantastic. Wow. Oh, they're so great every time, oh man. God. And really? Starship was great too, man. Yes, absolutely. What a great! They sounded great every single night. I've never seen them before. You know, they were a little bit before my time, so it was really. Yeah, good. yeah. and that thing was tremendous. It's funny, yo. Everybody's like they're a little bit before my time, but you knew every song, didn't you? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you never think yeah. about those songs as being Starship songs. They're just radio songs. They're songs you heard on the radio or MTV. <laughs> to your, you know, yeah. they were big yeah. on a lot of them were big on MTV. Yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, you were spot on also with your guitar playing from the Poison songs to the Journey songs to the Sugar Ray songs. Tell me a little about being involved in, as a musical director for Brett, that you have to know all of those songs and play them perfectly. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you know, I don't know that you have to play them perfectly. It, and it's funny because our other guitar player that recently joined our band, Dean um, Kramer, uh, me and him have strangely different not not so different views but different points of views on on that kind of stuff um the the uh you know it's funny you talk about having to learn all that stuff uh i also had to learn all the foreigner material because we've done a party girl with foreigner and then and d snyder uh the foreigner stuff was the most challenging so far uh a i'm not I'm not versed in it. I've never played any of it. I've never covered any of it in my life in any other other um, you know cover bands or anything I've ever did. Everyone's played those Journey songs or maybe a Twisted Sister song here or there, you know. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's two schools really. Um, there's learn this stuff exactly like the record, and or there's play it like you would play it, mm. you know. And you know, as long as you've known me, I'm I am from the Eddie Van Halen school, right. and you know, even you really got me. And Pretty Woman, or Pretty Woman especially, is nothing like the original. But when you're listening to it, you don't realize that until you listen to them back and forth, mm -hmm. and you're like, Eddie's, Eddie's doing all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. And uh, um, you know, so but so, uh, but I've spent my entire life. As much as I was an Edward Van Halen fan and as much as I was an Ace Frehley fan at an early age, something in me always knew to copying someone else isn't going to get you anywhere. So I took what I learned, but I've never once tried really hard to play like any of my heroes. You know, um, there's a couple occasions I have, but yeah. but I've never set I've never once set and said I have to master Eddie's technique or I have to play just like like Ace Freely. I I just want to play like me. Uh, and so the interesting thing is our new guitar player Dean, he is um he's a hundred times the guitar player I am. Wow. Uh, and and he he likes to learn everything so flawlessly perfect that uh. 
I, I have a great respect for it, but it's not my thing, you know? And I remember um, when we were rehearsing the journey songs, um, he'd actually said to me, are you, are you not going to learn the solo to um, separate ways? Exactly. Right. I said, no, I said, <laughs> I said, I said, I've spent my you know, 36 years trying to be me. I said, if Ed was in this band, if Eddie Van Halen was alive and in this band, he wasn't going to sit down and learn that Neil Sean solo note for note. You take the key parts or what's memorable, uh, you, you know, and um, so, and then so it's funny, our first day of rehearsals, uh, I could tell Dean was kind of watching Steve Azuri, waiting for Steve to say something, you know, and, uh, and Steve walked up to me, you know, he's very kind. You play with such soul and such passion and it's so great. And he, he actually, as he was walking over to me and complimented me, I saw out of the corner of my eye, I thought Dean was waiting for him to go, Hey, can you play that better or whatever? But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, but then I went and read online. I gotta be honest with you. I don't read a lot of stuff online. Um, and I, I just was curious and I read a few things the first couple of nights and, uh, the fans were really, complimentary directly toward me and the way I did play those journey songs, you know, and, you know, um, as much as I love CC and CC is now a guitar hero and, and he stood the test of time, all the other guys, you know, are, are gone. And I always laugh as when we were growing up, uh, CC and Mick Mars were both kind of not considered those in that class of Ingve Mom scenes and Edward Van Halen's right. and uh, and now they're the two left. Yes. They're, they're the ones that are the headlining the the stadiums and the arenas and stuff, <laughs> you know. Uh but but it's uh I'm never really judged on playing CC stuff by musicians, you know. Um and so I I went online after 20 years of of being the guy that plays CC stuff and read in the reviews people said i nailed the the journey stuff and it was it felt great because neil sean's a is a guitar hero and a guitar legend and uh everyone thought i did his stuff justice and uh that was a an amazing feeling it was an amazing feeling and then uh lou graham posted on my site um after we played with him he he made this wonderful post about how i added this great swagger to jukebox hero and he can't wait to do it again and uh I, you know but there is pressure because l l let me go back and rephrase that there is pressure because um i do go back and i do learn them exactly mm -hmm. i i learn them so i know exactly what to do and then i interject myself into it except for those foreigner songs they were so different to me that i i rhythmically played those that's probably the most concerned i ever was in my entire life i had no connection with lou graham until then i'd met him a few times um me and steve ajari had known each other a long time uh mm -hmm. me and mark mcgrath are good good buddies me and d snyder have played together several times but lou going in cold we played a stadium the first night we met him we, we it was a stadium in green bay and uh so i worked extra extra hard to to do that stuff right um but you have to you have to be you when you do it i believe that firmly man I, I thought it. I thought it was all done in the spirit. I thought it was flawless in my ears, and I've been listening to the song what for 40, 40 some odd years. Yeah, so yeah. I enjoyed it, and I thought it was spot on. So. In spirit is correct. In spirit is correct. Yeah, and it was good. Yeah. And you know, um, I have to wonder. In the book, you talk about coming up through the clubs. You know, slagging it through. You know, some of the worst clubs and some of the big clubs and the small clubs. And how did playing those cover songs night after night help you as a songwriter to understand melody and hits as a guitarist? And then, of course, to be Brett's musical director. Um, you know, it's, it's funny you say that. Um, you know, again, just like we're talking about the guitar playing between me and Dean, uh, there's always two ways to think about things. Most musicians either want to be all original and covers are lame or let's play covers and make the money and not write songs. Yeah. Um, and I walked both lines. I talk about walking both lines in the book yeah, a lot. Yeah. Uh, but you, um, you know, there's this really great songwriter named Mitch Allen, who's from my area. Do you know who Mitch is? No. Mitch is in that band, was in that band SR 71 that had that song. Um, uh, you may not be Miss Wright, but 
yeah, but you'll do right now. It was a big hit in the, in the early 2000s. And then he wrote a bunch of stuff, I think, for Pink and some different people. And he um, he was in the same boat as me. He would play covers and originals. And playing those covers teaches you how to write songs. Yes. It teaches you things you just don't think you know. And and um, uh, you have to do that. It gives you a sense of melody and technique and, and different things that, you know. But it also gets bored, boring. Um I, th- I think I told the story in the book, and if I didn't, it'll be an extra note uh, exclusive on your show, is I, I remember we were playing this club in Panama City, Club La Vila. Mm-hmm. And at Club La Vila, you play seven nights in a row, and uh, which was a great payday for a cover band, because yeah. in the, the two, early 2000s, that disappeared. You know, in the 70s and early 80s, a lot of clubs did uh hired you for a week and then it just disappeared uh but they kept doing it and we were playing them it's it's, it at the time if you ever do the research it was the largest nightclub in the united states the place capacity was over ten thousand people in this place um was that that's huge it's huge and it was uh it was right on the gulf of mexico and it's where mtv chose to do their spring break filming their spring breaks back in the day (laughs) and uh i remember it was one monday night and get into the off season and then it starts to get slow and there's, you're playing to five or six people. And I remember turning to my drummer at the time and saying all four sets tonight, every single song, I'm going to play the come on, feel the noise guitar solo. I'm going to make it fit in the right key in the right tempo, but I'm going to put this solo yeah. in 60 songs tonight. Oh and God. I did. I did it. Every <laughs> single song, I managed to put that that in there. And um, so so there was some boredom to be in 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 the cover band hustle like that. Right. But um, but that was also a test too, to be honest with you, to, to see if on the fly I could switch the keys and and make that solo work in every single song. You know, right. so so it was it was even when you were goofing off and being bored. I think I would always challenge myself from a cover band perspective, but it certainly teaches you how to, how to, uh, how to write. And, and, um, and as far as it being, helping me with uh, being a music director with Brett, um, it is important that I have such a giant catalog of cover right. music that come through because Brett at any given time will go, Hey, do you know Margaritaville? Let's do that tonight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or yeah. hey, I've I've heard you play. Uh, I remember I remember one night um, we were playing the Super Bowl party uh, in Indianapolis. The last time in it, last I'm I'm such not a sports guy. Forgive me. Yeah, the last know. the last time that Indianapolis hosted a Super Bowl, we were the entertainment for the pre party the night before at the stadium, like this giant crowd, and. Uh, I don't know. Was that you were on the field? Outside of outside, oh, outside of the field, the stadium. Yeah. But um, but we've done it on the field several times for different NFL and MLB stuff. But um, Brett, I wear in you know Indianapolis, Indiana, or in Illinois. It's Indiana, right? Indianapolis is Indiana. And uh, he said, "Let's do pink houses, like on the fly." Yeah. Not before the set, like on the stage. Right. Let's do pink houses. Now he knew I knew it, you know. And now it's funny I'm telling the story now because now that I've written that book, it's obvious that I know that song because I the whole book opens with me talking about Melon Camp. But uh, but um, he'll do that sometimes. He'll just call one night. He called Bob Seeger, uh, take those old records off the shelf. So so the ability to swing those covers and stuff like that, I think, has aided me in being Brett's music director. That's great. Yeah, I, I spoke to Niles Lofgren, who plays with Bruce Springsteen. Uh, yes. And he said Bruce will call audibles. Right, yeah. Right there on stage. And he would just say, let's do this song. And you just, yeah. he, he had to know the whole Bruce Springsteen catalog, top to bottom. So That's like, right. It's very nerve wracking. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. You know, Nils is from here, from Washington, D.C., where I'm from. Okay. I've only run into him once when I was a real young kid. Uh, I, I don't know much about what he does now or, or where he's at, but uh, he, he, you know, it's funny. A lot of people say things about, uh, Oh, I think this person's underrated or that person's underrated. My favorite of all underrated is I think Alex Van Halen's underrated. No, he's not. Everyone knows he's fucking great. Yeah. Like, 
he's not underrated. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, I, but I would say that uh, I would say Nils, Gro- Nils Lofgren is an incredibly underrated player. I you know, I think that's just a common word now. Everybody just associates. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's underrated. He's been around for 40 years. He's underrated. No, it's yeah. not. I, I heard someone the other day say something about Stephen Piercy being underrated. I'm like, yeah, round and round, right. super underrated. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I heard that with Steve Stevens, too. Underrated. Where, do you, where have you been? <laughs> yeah, he's a guitar hero. <laughs> Steve he's Stevens a guitar is, hero, right? Yeah. He's and he's incredible. He's yeah. incredible, man. I saw Billy Idol uh, right before COVID, and it was Billy was great. Billy shocked me how great he was, but it it was a Steve Stevens show without a doubt, man. Yeah, I you know, that. yeah. I saw them and Brian Adams, and I, uh, you know, I'm I'm a gigantic Brian Adams fan, and uh, that's another one. Keith Scott. It's funny, maybe he's underrated because him and Mike Campbell. You know, do you know who they are? No, Mike. Mike was Tom Petty's guitar player. Okay. The guy that played on Boys of Summer. Yeah, well, I'm not a huge Tom Fetty fan, but yeah, more I guess, like well, the metal genre. But you know Boys of Summer, right? Yeah, yeah. And those licks are so tasty, right? Oh yeah. And Mike wrote that whole song, and it's funny. It's funny he took that song to Tom Petty, Boys of Summer, and Tom said, "No, I don't think this is any good." <laughs> and, you know, it's funny how that works, right? Yeah. But uh, and Keith Scott is Brian Adams' guitar player, and uh, are you a Brian Adams fan at all? I do, yes, I'm Brian Adams fan. You know that song, Somebody? Yeah. And it's like, bow, bow, but da, da, na, we, na, na. it's the simplest lick in the world, but I would have traded everything I know to have just written that one lick. You know? yeah. So those guys are maybe underrated players, but you know, but they're living in giant mansions. Brian's taking care of Keith his whole life. So what does underrated mean, right? Right, exactly. But I, I loved your book. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I loved the fact that... It, I could relate to it because I was in a band, cover band growing up, a heavy metal, hard rock cover band, and we would play clubs. We didn't have gigs like you did in those great places. We were very small clubs, but it was still fun, and it was just such a great. I did those. Time. I did those too, and I still do them. Yeah, I still, you know, the the night after Camden, I think I went home because it was close enough home, and I think that uh, that that was was that a that was a that Sunday was a Sunday. night. That was a Sunday night. Sunday night. And I think I went home and Monday night I played this little brewery acoustic um, with uh, me and my my drummer Chuck. And uh, I played for three and a half hours for probably four or five people. And I still, to this day, love doing that as much as the big stuff. I, I get different things from both, but both are equally satisfying to me. Yeah. It was a good, it, and I, I love the book because I could relate to it and I enjoyed hearing about it and the stories and behind the scenes. And I, I got a kick out of all the drinking you guys did. That was a lot. I didn't ever drink that much, but you guys did a lot of drinking with the Jägermeister. You know, yeah, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Nice dispenser on the truck. Right. There, well, there's a handful of times of us. we see those guys. I see those guys from the old band and we literally, we don't joke. We look at each other and we're like, how did we live through that? Right. Like it, it was it was um, ridiculously decadent. And uh, we never met anyone any harm. And no one ever really got hurt other than you read in the book about my bass player hitting that pole. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, but no one ever got hurt. But I, I can't believe we didn't, you know. And you said you used to hit that Jägermeister, too. Yeah, did it did it up until my thirties till I got sick on it, and then I said, you know, this is just not good. <laughs> it but never it, tasted good. It was just you just did it. Well, so for me, if you would drink it out of that machine, not like out of the bottle at the bar, but if you had one of those Jaeger machines, that's that thing would get it so cold. Yeah, that that it did taste good, and that's the problem is when it tastes good, right? Yeah, that, that, that definitely. You know, I, that we we make the joke a lot that. Um, I don't drink nearly as much anymore, but I still do drink. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm doing this acoustic thing with Chad Stewart from Faster Pussycat. And when we do that, we do drink like the old days. Wow. And, and uh, but I'm an early riser now. I, I'm I'm 8.30 in the morning is late for me, right? So mm-hmm. even if I'm partying all night long or whatever, I get up at 8.30 and I don't really have hangovers. And everyone will be like, I can't believe you have a hangover. And I'm, to me, I'm like, well, that's actually the problem. The fact that I don't have a hangover yeah. means I have a serious drinking problem, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, so you where do where Jägermeister? Did, but no, I, I'll do Jägermeister once in a while. Me and Chad will do a shot just to just to talk about the past. But you know, I, I've turned into a bourbon guy. I even have my own line of bourbon. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, I like, I like my Jack Daniels and my different whiskeys and stuff like that. Um, but, but like you said, once you get sick on something, it's hard to go back to it. Yeah. Tequila, gin, and Jägermeister. I won't drink. And Goldschlager. Well, so, so Goldschlager was my first problem. Uh, when I started <laughs> drinking, so that was, I was exclusively a Goldschlager guy. Oh my God. And, and then one night, um, and I think I talk about this in the book too. We were playing a place in Ocean City, Maryland, mm-hmm. and it was across the street. It wasn't on the beach. It was across the highway. Right. And about three songs to the end of it, I was so fucked up on the Goldschlager that I literally just dropped my guitar like it was a dress, like like a girl taking a dress off. I just threw it off the back of my shoulders. I dropped my guitar. I stepped out of the strap, and I walked straight out of the club. The band wasn't done yet. <laughs> I walked straight out of the club and straight out into the ocean and my brother who's passed away now and his son uh ben if i don't know what would happen if they didn't go out and get me because wow. i didn't know what i was doing yeah but they all said i just it was like i was aquaman and was just walking into the water and i don't <laughs> i don't know I, I don't know but later that night i got sick yeah water, and i've never i can't even look at the bottle again you know, and I'm that I'm that way with tequila too. Yeah. I've had it. Yeah, and it sucks because the smell of tequila, just the smell of tequila. <laughs> the smell of tequila makes my stomach turn, yeah. and it sucks because I'm such good friends with the warrant guys, and I love those warrant guys. And uh, but but they always carry that bottle of yeah or that bottle of tequila around all of them like they're tequila. <laughs> uh, so when 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 their band and my band drank together, we both have to have our own different bottles because yeah, you know. What I what I loved about the book also was that um, your determination and your you know working towards your goals to be MTV famous to be a rock star you never deviated from that dream. Everyone dreams, but um, it sounds as if you you dreamed bigger than most. Was that the case? I don't know because I don't I, I don't know if I dream bigger than most. But I reality bigger than most, that's for sure. Yeah. I don't know what other people dream. A lot of people hide it. You know, I yeah. I am, you know, I would like to believe that all I ever dreamed about was 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 being on those stages. And I did that a long time ago. Um that's an interesting question, Robert. <laughs> uh, but didn't you have that same dream? I did. I did. But I didn't have the skills you had. I was kind yeah. of an average guitar player and uh, you know. We were doing it for the girls, and that was really, I think, our motivation more than anything else. Meeting girls. You know who else was an average guitar player? Who? Kurt Cobain. Yeah. You get what I'm saying, right? I do, I do, I do. You can go real far with a little if you have the right, you know, the right drive. And that's what I did. I'm 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 average at best at everything I do. I just believe in knocking down the doors. Yeah. And the older I get, the more I realize how fortunate i've been but not for it's none of it's been luck because mm-hmm. it's it's been a long long road and it's been uh hard. it's it's been hard but it's not um but i'm fortunate and it, with everything i do nowadays i don't even i don't care about my own rewards all i all i think about is hopefully someone sees me and goes if that fucking dude did it i can do it too okay. to any whether it's the candles or the bourbon or writing a book or, you know, just minutes before I talked to you, I actually launched my brand new company, the Virginia sauce and spice company. Cool. Like, like at six o'clock tonight, we launched it. Uh, I I've been working on this one longer than I've worked. I, this has been the longest lift there's ever been in my life. It, we started this one before COVID and we just launched it today. So like over, over three years of work, but, um, but it's an interesting concept if you don't mind me. Yeah, no, here. please. I didn't know about it. Um, so I'm a giant foodie. I love, I love that word. I, don't, I hate that word. I've never said it before, <laughs> but, but I am, uh, I am. And I like um, to eat. How about just say that? I like to eat. Yeah. And I, I'm a big, uh, I like spicy stuff. Uh, but I also, so I'm, I'm a Jamaican jerk guy. I love the Jamaican spices and stuff right. like that. And so for years and years and years, I would make this marinade when I would have, uh, parties or cookouts or things i would make this marinade that you could put on chicken or shrimp and it it, it had it i call it influenced by jamaican but it's um it's 100 unique if you were to have it you would believe that it, it's something you've never tasted before nice. and it's it's very sweet and it's very spicy but it's unique and uh so 
I have tons of friends that make barbecue sauces or make hot sauce and or or all these different sauces, and none of them do anything with it, right? So I wasn't very interested in being in the food business, um, but in my brain I went, let me figure out how to do this, how to distribute food and sell it, mm-hmm. and show my friends all of them all I, you can't imagine the friends i have in virginia that love to make their barbecue sauces and oftentimes say to me i wish i could start a company or they they relate it to shining soul the candle company they're like i wish i could do like you did with the candle company so me and my buddy clark started this company the virginia sauce and spice company yeah. and i have this one recipe that is the first product and it's called evic number no. four and uh clark is like the most famous chef in our town he works for almost every restaurant he comes up with menus or or recipes and all this stuff but but his big signature thing is a ketchup that he came up with and uh he um he had his he had the birth is the story behind the ketchup's great he the um his son was born and because clark is such a food guy he he was you know he knew that the first thing we do as parents is basically addict our children to ketchup Right off the bat, you're putting ketchup in your kid's mouth. It's the first real flavor after baby food they get, you know, with their McDonald's fries. And, uh, you know, and so he thought, why don't I start with trying to make the healthiest version of ketchup I possibly can? Because he didn't want his own kid to, you know, everyone becomes a diabetic now. I mean, Brett's the king diabetic, but I mean, it's, it's like, it's a monster, you know, but it's because of the way we all eat, you know? And, uh, and so he has this ketchup, but the way we've designed the company is I took from the music business is it's going to be the Virginia sauce and spice company is going to be run like a record label. And if you come to me and you say, I have a product, then I'm going to make sure I like it because I'm going to get behind it, but I'll distribute your product for you under my label. Right. So, because. So I'm not going to be making a bunch of new recipes. I don't have time for that. I don't have any interest for that. I had that one recipe that started the company. But from here on out, it's for my friends and for other people in my area that can't get the business sense behind a food product they may have. That sounds awesome. What a great idea. Yeah, I thank wish you. The best. And I'll put, a, I'll put a link um, oh, right. on the part of the uh, text part that, you know, could yeah. to look it up. Yeah, so maybe I do dream bigger. Maybe I do. <laughs> yeah, that's the way you should. You know, yeah. I was thinking to myself too, you're, you mentioned it earlier, was I was in the cover band, you were in the cover band, but your dad and your parents were very behind you with that. They even, you know, so to speak, your father took a second mortgage to yeah. give you a recording studio at a right. young age. I forget how old you were, but at a young age, they hooked you up with a business. So they must have believed in you. You know, my parents were like, Get a job, you know, that yeah. go to college, parents, and get a job. My parents were the exact opposite. My, I often say that that was the one difference in me and everyone else that I know that, you know, because there becomes, when you get to a level that I'm at, which, you know, I'm not Brett Michaels or John Bon Jovi, but I'm a professional musician. I'm really, this is, you know, this is real. I do this for a living. When you get to that level, you, you know, normally I'm sure all your friends growing up, you're all musicians because that was your clique, right? Y'all. That's where we hung out. Yeah. And and you and you start to think to yourself, why? What didn't happen for anyone else? And my mom, man, she she was clear. She said, her exact words were, "Put yourself in a position where the only way you'll be able to feed your family is with that guitar. Just make that wow. make it that way. Basically, paint yourself in a corner is what her rule was, and come out fighting. And and that's what I did. But I took it a little different than that because I learned how to produce records and make records, engineer records. I learned how to do live sound. And, and, and um, I was also, I, I was a teacher. I taught guitar. I taught vocal. I taught piano. Uh, uh, so I learned how to be in the music business. It wasn't to me just about playing the guitar yeah. or, or, or singing. Uh, and I think that's what got me through because teaching, teaching guitar is great money. And, and, exactly. and, and, um, it's a lifesaver for a struggling musician that really isn't getting that nine to five job, you know? 
I, I did. I did. I used to drive to kids' houses. I worked in the mall in a record store, and the kids would come in buy the heavy metal albums and the rock albums, and I would say, "Hey, do you look? At, you play guitar? Yes, I'm just starting out." I say, "Hey, let me teach you." And I would charge yeah. like eight dollars or nine dollars an hour and drive to their house a couple of towns <laughs> away to do it. Right. And, you know, I was 18, 19 years old, and I was teaching them beginner stuff. To, to that's make- right. And it was, right. he learned, I benefited and it was good. And I still have those kids. Some of those kids are my best friends to this day. Still know them, right? Yeah, yeah, right. I, I know a handful of the people that I, I used to teach and I still keep up with the teachers that I learned from. Yeah. I actually hang out with uh, my high school music theory teacher. Uh, he comes to see my shows and, and we, nice. we're better friends now than we ever were. The weird thing though is it's 36 years later and he looks identical. I'm the one that got older. It's really, <laughs> really strange thing. But, but, uh, you know, um, what record store did you work at? Uh, record town. I All right. worked, and it was, uh, it was in the mall and it was a record. It was a chain and it was called record record town. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's funny. Like I think about my kids, especially my my youngest, who's pursuing a career in music. Uh, they'll never know that yeah. feeling. I love yeah, I, the the only the the only time I ever worked not at a music store like guitar store was a brief time I worked at a record chain down here called Waxy Maxies, and uh, but but it was cool. Yeah, it's where cool. it was like. You got you were breathing in your own education at your pace. It was I, I worked there about the time that the Edie Brickell song was huge. Um what I am is what I am, you know that song. Yeah, yeah. And uh I remember we would never fight, we would let each other play it, but the one other person that would work when I worked loved that record. And I think if I'm correct, Skyscraper from Dave Lee Roth had just come out that same time I was working yeah. there. And <laughs> So all day long, we'd go back and forth between uh, Edie Brickell and David Lee Roth. Edie Brickell and David <laughs> Roth. Uh, yeah. But, the, but those memories, man, I mean, don't you have great memories of all of that? I do. I do. My, my, my best friend was the assistant manager. When the manager would leave, he would listen to all that new wave stuff and new, yeah. And he would put that on. And we really didn't have a say because he was the manager. And my buddy was the assistant manager. And when he left, it was all hard rock. You know, yeah, right. that's, that's what we... And we would just be selling tons of hard rock out the door when we were playing it. But yeah, I yeah. was there right when Whitney Houston released that album with the orange cover. I forget uh-huh. the name of it. And then uh, Bruce Springsteen put out his box set where it was CD, cassette, and album. Are, and are that, you a Springsteen fan? Uh, I'm the hits guy. My wife is a big Bruce Springsteen, Elton John, Billy Joel fan. That's kind of, you know, on the end. And Brett. And Brett. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you watched his thing on Broadway though, the Netflix no. special on Broadway? No, it is the most fascinating and amazing thing I've ever seen as far as musician kind of specials. I gotta check it out. You should, but him playing the songs is irrelevant. It's his storytelling between the songs that's captivating and fascinating. You could literally just fast forward through the songs. You, you know what I mean. Yeah. So it's interesting. He cracks me up, though. He tells that story. Uh, and I don't know if you, you know this. I, maybe maybe you do. Uh, you know, he didn't even have a driver's license. When he wrote Born to Run, mm-hmm. he'd never even driven a car. Well, that's funny. It's a fascinating story to hear him tell it. I have to it, check it out. Well, it's on it, YouTube, you said? Or Netflix? Oh, on Netflix, yeah. Netflix. You got to check it out. Yes. You know, we, we talked about, you know, you slugging it out in the clubs and your father supporting you. Um, what was plan B? We're not talking the candle story yet, but what was plan B in your mind, young Pete? There was never. There was. And it's funny, I still talk to people today, especially after writing the book and some of my old friends and, and people have, have bought the book and, and call me up. Uh, it, it, there just was never. There was never. I have talked to a lot Robert. of people who say the same thing. Yeah, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, there was fear though. When the grunge thing hit, I was scared to fucking death. Yeah. Because we had what it took if the music would have stayed the same. But, and I talk about that in the book. That's why I opened that recording studio. So maybe the studio was plan B. In the back of mind, yeah. Learning to produce records. Um, but it, it was, you know, it was that that grunge thing was a really weird time for me because I I learned without trying to insult people, I learned 
how do I say it, man? I crack up when I think that at that time, Bon Jovi had sold 40 million records. And all of a sudden, because someone else said he wasn't cool, 40 million people weren't coming to see him anymore. Hmm. Do, you, do you get where I'm going? Like that was, a, totally, yeah. I've heard this. You know, really, you know, I think about that with Nickelback. Whether you, I understand a lot of people don't love Nickelback, but Nickelback, like what happened to the '80s bands with the grunge, singly happened to Nickelback. Yeah. They took the front for the entire genre. Like, like they were, they were a giant sellout band, and the next night everyone hates Nickelback. It's it's weird how that works. And yeah. when the grunge, and when the grunge thing came, uh, I watched a lot of my friends put the flannel on. And and all of a sudden they were, were into it. Doing it. And I just wasn't. I just yeah. wasn't. Now I like like last night I went to go see my good good friend uh, Josie Scott from Saliva. Mm-hmm. Saliva was more new metal than grunge. Yes, which was much different, you know. Yeah. But he played uh, in his set. He played them bones from Alice in Chains, uh, and that was awesome. That was a great song. And as I've grown older, I've grown to appreciate all of it. I do. But I. I could have never have faked it. Right. So, if that, so, so to me, to me, it wasn't like I ever went, Oh, maybe I wasn't talented enough to do this. I actually went, my job was taken away from me. Yeah. You know? And, and it's, it's funny because I've actually thought about making a documentary. There's a lot of movies and stories and stuff about the bands like firehouse and trickster and 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 i call them that the that last wave of yes. hard rock that got there but never reached their full potential Absolutely. because they got wiped off the map and that that's a huge story that people like to invest in I, i've often danger, thought danger oh then yeah you know i was yeah. talking to Holy today you know yeah, danger don't miss it out yeah, absolutely. He used uh, to come into the mall all the time in the record store. Him and Bruno would come in and they wear their big uh, Danger Danger leather, you know, jackets with the yeah, Bruno. I tell a story about Bruno in the book, if you remember. Yes, Did yes. you tell it? Yeah. That's what I mentioned. But, um, but um, what is my point that I was telling you? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, about but, the documentary. I, but, I, but I feel like someone could make a documentary about a bunch of the bands that were where I was at, where we were climbing and never even signed the deal. Like at least bands like Tough and Danger Danger and those guys, they did sign a deal. They did get to the video. We were, I was that next tier that was going to happen and and never even had the opportunity. And it wasn't like, oh, let's go home and keep trying. It was just over. Yeah, it was a done deal. Right? Yeah, you know. Well, one of the most fascinating stories I thought was in the book, because I have this reoccurring nightmare. You're, you just started playing with Brett after hard work, networking, you're playing with Brett, your first show 50, in front of 50,000 people, and you're not well rehearsed with the band. I mean, what was going through your head? Because that, those are the nightmares I have where I'm like, I'm in, I'm in Def Leppard and I'm playing with Def Leppard and I don't even have the sound on on my guitar, but I don't even know the songs, you know? You know, it's funny. The first year that I was with Brett, um, the very first year, uh, do you know, you know the song Something to Believe in? Of course, yeah. You exactly. know what? Uh, he does that acoustic thing at the intro because we don't do it with the piano at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then I do that lick, right? And then the whole song kicks in. And there was one night we were in uh, Minnesota and I was completely unaware that something had gone wrong with my gear. It was working just a minute ago, the song before, right? Yeah. And I turned my volume up and I went, and nothing came out. Oh. And so, like something, my battery and my tuner went dead or whatever it was. And I looked at him because we weren't buddies yet. You know what I'm saying? He was still the big, bad, scary boss that I was trying to impress every night. Right. And I, you could tell that it blew, it, it deflated him too. Cause that's that giant moment when the song kicks in. Yeah. And, and so that fear lives with me to this day. I, can I play, I play on that stage all night long without a worry. You watch me, Robert. I'm not, it's not a bragging thing. I just, I breathe the guitar. That doesn't mean I'm great at it, but it's an extension of who I am. There's no, there's, you, you see what I'm saying, right? I agree. It's, yeah, I see it. Yeah, I see it in your face and the notes and the, yeah, your body but, is making the no, notes come out of the guitar. It's the body, and, little body English, you know? And I'm alive and I'm free and on top of the world all night long, except for that minute before I have to do that, like 20 years later, still, I'm still scared to death that's going to happen again <laughs> you know what I mean? crazy so so i relate to your nightmares you know <laughs> yeah 
you know, but that first gig, um, well, that first gig, it's, it's weird to me that Brett thought it was okay to do that without rehearsing. Right. 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 But, um, you know, and it, it's funny because it goes back to the cover band thing. Uh, we learned those songs identical to the poison records. And if, had we, if, had that been how that was supposed to go, the gig would have been flawless. Right. But Brett himself, any band evolves a song after 20 or 30 years, whether you think you're playing it different or not, something changes right. and, and you start playing it different. So he had evolved those songs in his own mind in a way that when we played them that night, we didn't play bad. It just didn't lock in. I, I, I I have never seen it with my own eyes, but I've heard after 20 years from enough people that me and Brett, you know, we, we have that chemistry. Maybe we're not Dave and Eddie, but we do, we're a team, Yeah, you know, and, and it, we didn't have it that night. <laughs> uh, and it just took a little while to forge. That's all. Yeah. 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 It came shortly after, but yeah, that was horrifying. Yeah. Um, but I was cocky and I thought we were going to kill it. And we, we probably did kill it, but I thought it was terrible. There was, but a lot of what was terrible wasn't the playing. It was things I didn't like, for instance, during the something to believe in guitar solo that night, I turned around and put my foot on the drum riser and played it to Chuck. And Brett was like, what the fuck are you doing? You're not here to play with Chuck. You, you play to the audience. And yeah. that was a big lesson that you, that I still think about today. In fact, I, you know, whenever we get a new member in the band, I have to give them that lesson. You're not here to turn around and jam with the drummer. You're here to entertain those people that paid those tickets to see you play. And uh, so that very first night, I just learned an enormous amount of lessons of what pro is. And even when you're in the cover bands, and you might be the best cover band in the area, you probably do something that's so unpro and you don't realize it, you know, uh, how, you know, I, how many times I go see a cover band now and they all look at their phones while the singer's talking about introducing the next song or whatever. And they'll look down and they're looking at their phones or, or, or even just having beers and stuff on stage. I, I'm not an advocate of not drinking on stage. I do a lot, but like the beer can sitting around, that's a difference in your cover band. And, and you, you know what I'm saying? Guns yes. and Roses, biggest drinking band in the world. What's it? Yeah. You so, know, and you just, you just, you just learn that stuff. Yeah. I get, it. I get it. You know, in the book, you also talk about, you had, um, you had a breakdown at one point. I guess you could, is it safe to call it a breakdown or? It depends on which part you're talking about. <laughs> well, you had the breakdown right after you were playing with Brett you had, after the real world. Uh, oh, was, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it was it was at your lowest point, right? Be, and the right when you got into candle making. Yes, was yes. it really hard to talk about or to put into print the breakdown leading into the candle, the epiphany with the candle making? Oh. Uh. There was a hand, there was three or four stories in that book that were painful to write, yeah. you know, uh, but I felt like it was important because it was part of the journey. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, even talking to you right now, reliving that night, um, the night before I went to the hobby store to buy the candle supplies, right. which is uh, just, just you bringing it up. I, it feels like the light gets a little cooler right around me. I, 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 it, I, I still get a very sad emotion thinking about that particular evening. Yeah. No matter what. Yeah. So yeah. But it yeah. was an epiphany, right? It you oh, yeah. it took oh, yeah. you out of the depressive state and it you launched, yeah. you know, a uh, shining soul from it. And now yeah. it's uh, you know, brick and mortar and online. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. But it's a it's you know, what there's a Keel song. Are you a Keel fan at all? To some degree. I know the first album. Yeah, the, the second record had a song, uh, The Calm Before the Storm. Yeah, I don't know that one. And it had a lyric that always stuck with me. It's always darkest before the dawn. Yeah. And that's what yeah. that evening was. Yes. It, 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 very much to me. It was that. And uh, so, yeah, that was hard to write. That was hard to write about. And writing about that, the, the hardest story in the book for me to tell was the story about the song with Miley Cyrus doing so well and, and feeling all alone that morning. Yeah, when no one but else it was odd, right? Was that that was odd? Yeah, that was like you know, it was, yeah. taking it right down. It was like a spiral. You could see it. it. It was, it was, it was a single loneliest moment I think I've ever felt in my whole life. And no one was being a dick to me. No one, nothing was wrong. It yeah. was just the cards had been played to make that a a a 
and whatever lesson I learned from that, maybe it's made me a better person. I don't know, but to, to really have the single greatest day of your entire life happening at the exact moment, the worst day of your life is happening is a real fucking weird day. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, totally. I get yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And nobody around to like to bring you out of it. You know, there was nobody yeah. to talk to. So, yeah, don't think of it that way. Think of it this way. You, you no, kind of was, your own devices. I was one. That was the most alone I've ever been in my entire life was that day. You right. know, it was, but but there's there's, you know, it, it was still the greatest day. And I mean, I I wrote a song that topped Bon Jovi on the charts. <laughs> so it's incredible. Congratulations. That's you. You got to be a Jovi fan. Are you not? Yes. Jovi. Yes. Huge. We do Wild in the Streets in my acoustic set. It's one of my favorite songs of this day. That's a great song. That's a really good song. I, my, wife I, 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 my wife and I were married to our wedding song was by Joe song. Uh I forget the name of it. But yeah. Is this she right behind you? <laughs> She's upstairs. What was the name of it? Uh, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Oh, what a great song. What a yeah, great song. That was our, I don't know why I forget that often, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know I the could... rockers, you know, I know the rockers. I, I, you know, even though I'm I'm ten years divorced, I, you if I had a gun to my head, I don't think I could tell you what my wedding song was. I have to be honest with you. That's funny. I, you brought that up, and I started trying to think, and I don't I don't have a I don't have a single clue what that song was. I know the song when she says it. Thank you for letting. Hey, 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 but hey. it always takes me a minute to jog my memory. Um, what what did you did Brett read the book? Did you give him a copy? Did you get some feedback from him? Uh, I didn't give him the book yet. Oh. He read my first book and he read it in a in a one setting overnight in the back of the bus. Um and and he's asked for a copy of it. I just haven't given it to him yet because I want to talk to him before I give it to him. There's there's two or three stories in there that um I've already warned him. I, I said when you read this book, wherever you think I'm going, promise me before you get mad and throw it across the room that you read to the end of the story. Yeah. I said, because in every story that I mention you, you're the king. Very I complimentary, make, yes. I make you out to be my best friend. I make you out to be my teacher, my mentor, my father figure. I yeah. said, I said, but there's a couple moments you're going to be reading this and go, where the fuck is this about to go? And just get to the end of the story <laughs> well that's what makes the story good you know it's all the setup howard stern is notorious for doing tremendous setups that really right. suck you in and pull you in and then he he tells the story and you're you're on the edge of the seat and you did the exact same thing with your stories but yeah. it was always complimentary you never said anything disparaging no, in the least bit so yeah i don't know but that particular story right there that we're talking about where he didn't seem to care as much as i did about the song in in if he was to if he was to start reading that without being warned, he would get mad. Oh, okay. not mad, but he would think that I was saying that he didn't care. And I go on to explain that he does care. And it's actually, I think that I make my the my most proud moment in that book is telling that story. And I make the comparison because I'm not a football guy, but I make the comparison about what it. I I say, I'm trying to explain why Brett wasn't as excited as I was about the song being a hit is I talk about a football player that used to play on a hundred yard football field who suddenly they've turned the field into a 50 yard field. And no matter how good you do, you can't feel as accomplished as it must have felt to play in that bigger field. Yeah, it's good so, so Brett is still a giant, huge superstar. It's just the game has changed. There's nothing any of us could do about no. the streaming and, and all that stuff. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, and uh, and he's yeah, used to that world differently than what you were used to say again he's very different he's used to that world back in the day of the 80s yeah. when it was all about gold records and sales and now it's all about streams and listens and stuff like right. that it's a different world and YouTube, you know? and YouTube views right, right, right. Yeah. I, I want to be respectful to you Tom one last question what's your relationship like with Cece because you were on tour with Poison for a while as I guess a friend of Brett yeah so you know I'll say this Cece's either the single greatest guy on the planet or he is the absolute biggest liar in the world he's he's one of the two because uh he may hate me he i've never heard anyone say it, everyone tells me he says wonderful things about me but when we're together he takes his time to spend with me 
we talk, we hang out. Um, you know, when, when me and my wife first were getting divorced, um, I didn't want anything to do with the divorce. And the truth of the matter is I didn't want anything to do with her anymore, yeah. but I didn't want to do that to my kids. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I was so fucking twisted and upset about it. And my, my ex-wife at the time was a bartender and I'll never forget. CC called her at one thirty in the morning and sat on the phone with her for almost two hours trying to explain to her the value of saving the marriage. Wow. Like, like, so there was a moment, there was a moment in my life where CC essentially came to what I considered my rescue. Yeah. <laughs> you know Absolutely. What I mean? But, but, but he's so nice to me and, and he's, he's complimentary to me and we laugh and we have a good time. I remember, uh, there, I remember one time we had a, a poison rehearsal and a lot of times I go to the rehearsals and I, I'll sing for Brett just so he's usually taking care of other business and, and stuff like that. And um, there was this moment where me and Cece both had acoustic guitars and somehow Brett ended up right between us. And uh, the look on Brett's face was a fear. And it was, it was just this neat moment that uh, me and Cece were laughing that Brett was, stuck between both his guitar players. What a terrible place for a lead singer to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. And someone took a picture of it. Me and Cece holding up the guitars uh, with Brett in the middle. And, uh, but the picture never surfaced. There were so many people in that room that night and so much happening. And me and Cece both said, someone get a picture of this. And it never, it ne I don't know who did or whatever showed up, but, but Cece's great, man. Um, and, and all he cares about right now is that kid of his. His his kid Valen's a drummer. Have you seen this kid play the drums? No, no. he's a monster, man. Really? Like he could have, he could have joined the Foo Fighters. Really, that good, huh? And he's young. He's young. Um, but but the answer to that is, I have all the respect in the world for CC. Um, he wrote those songs and those hooks, and he's he's kind to me. I remember uh, on the stadium tour. Uh, I came out to the Washington DC show, which was maybe six shows in mm -hmm. and the whole news about him playing eruption had already made waves. You know, they put that big Van Halen flag up right on the screen and he played. And uh, when I, when he caught my eye that day for the first time, I hadn't seen him in a couple of years and he, you know, he ran over to me, he goes, is it good? I said, what are you talking about? CC, you know, is it good? Am I doing it good? I said, you don't have to ask me that. I said, you know, it's good. You know, you know, it's great. He goes, yeah, but you're a Van Halen fan like I am. And is it good? I said, Cece, it's, it's fucking great. You, you've, uh, you're playing it flawless. And I thought it was neat that he asked me that. Yeah. Because if anybody in the world could have a problem with me, it's him. Right. You know, that's what I was thinking. You know, every day that that band, that solo band plays, Maybe it should be poison and maybe I'm taking money out of CC DeVille's pocket. And right. he, he, you know, th there is one guy in the band that, that hates it with a passion. I know. The, the, the soul band, <laughs> you know, uh, know. you know, but, um, but CC, CC is great to me. I can't say. And the other thing I can't say enough about CC is no matter how good you think he is, he's better. <laughs> he, he can play you every Malmsteen lick you ever heard. Wow. He, can, he can play every Van Halen lick you've ever heard. And if you're ever backstage at a Poison show, he wakes up in the morning, he does his jog. You know, he's famous for his jogging. And then he sits in his dressing room and he plays the fucking guitar all day. And he he's... And he'll laugh. He'll go, I get up on the stage and something changes. And, I, you know, it's the difference becoming an entertainer versus a musician. And when he's on the stage, he's entertaining. And when he's... Brother, I, can't, I just can't tell you, there ain't nothing that guy can't play. Awesome. And, and I don't think a lot of people really know that. You know? Know. No, yeah. Is that underrated? Yeah. I don't know. It's underrated that it's not known. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, listen, Pete, I want to thank you so much for your time. I love the book, MTV Famous. It's tremendous. And I, I wish you the best it. with it. And your, your new venture with your sauces and your new venture with, uh, or your existing venture with your candle making. 
Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for always having me on here, man. I wish we could do this more. I, I, I would love to find more reasons to chat with you, man. Yeah. Yeah. Always just reach out to me. And I know that you're going to be playing Englewood with Brett, Englewood, New Jersey. Are you coming down? Yeah. In January. So yeah. And maybe we could grab a bite to eat. I could take you out to dinner. That'd be great. Is that in January or December? Hold on. I'm checking my calendar right now. December 14th. Sorry. My bad. My bad. My bad. December 14th. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, because I knew I have something on the January uh, 12, 13, 14 weekend that I have to do. Yeah, there's not, there's, and I was like, you just, I just had a heart attack, right? I yeah, just, I apologize. Yeah, everybody out there, it was Englewood, New Jersey on December 14th. So, yeah. Yeah. So you so grab come a bite on. if you got time. Yeah. Reach out yeah, to me. And learn, let, let's learn some songs and you jam at Soundcheck with us. When's yeah. the last time you played with a band? Do you still play at all? Uh, I still play, but not with a band. I don't want to yeah. embarrass myself in front of you, but I I'll, is, we'll do a simple ACDC song or two. What is what is your favorite stuff? Like what? Oh, I was um, I was big on Judas Priest. That was oh, yeah. on guitar. Some of my favorite stuff to play on guitar was Judas Priest. Um, I love that. A lot of Iron Maiden growing up. I played a lot of Iron Maiden. A lot of Motley Crue. I played that, and some of it's still muscle memory, all through COVID. I was, you know, there was nowhere to go. And I was just sitting there. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, I think I still remember Trooper. Yeah, yeah. There, 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 you know, there, in, there. The, in the acoustic gig that I do with Chad, my favorite part of the night is um, we do this kind of mashup where I do uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Run to You from Brian Adams, mm -hmm. to another thing coming from Judas Priest. But, but we play parts of the other two, but I play the entire – she was pre-song acoustic. And uh, we, we did it the other night. And the guys in Trickster, I, we opened up for the guys in Trickster. And uh, they couldn't believe it. That was when we walked on stage. The only thing they could talk about was the acoustic Judas Priest track. You know? <laughs> I'm good friends with Steve Brown. We grew yes. up. I, uh, I bought one of his guitars. Which one? The SBS guitar that his brand new brand he has. Oh, yes. Yes. I just saw that. Yeah. Right. He was yeah. playing black one. I just saw it on Twitter. Yeah. He, you want to, so... It, honestly, he is truly the most underrated guitar player on the planet. Yeah, talented kid. Well, he's a kid. He's a guy now, but he was a kid when I knew him. We grew up too, but well, and, and a great guy. And Very you nice know, person. he's producing Ace Frehley's new record. Yeah, I saw him a couple of months back. We were talking about it. So yeah, probably did do it you you with him when it comes out. Did he let you hear anything on it? No, no, no. He he gave me a guitar pick, but he didn't let me hear anything. Are you are you a Kiss fan at all? Huge, huge Kiss fan. And an Ace Frehley fan? Of course. So, Paul Stanley was my idol, but of course, the whole Kiss thing. I love it. So uh, I've heard a couple of these tracks. They're good? It is what we all have wanted for 40 years. Really? It sounds like what should have been the follow-up to his solo record in 1978. Oh my it, god! It feels like that, buddy. It feels like it feels like rip it out, and it feels like Rocket Ride, which was on a live too. But Ozone, it, and yeah, it, 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 brother, I got chills talking to you about it right now. <laughs> I, I wasn't supposed to hear any of it, but we were in the dressing room, and I talked to him into letting me hear it. And it is, you know, and Ace is my friend. Ace is a, is a good buddy of mine. He gave a quote in my book. It was the most, yes. uh, the, the most amazing thing in the world that when he agreed yeah. to do that. But, uh, but if you're a Kiss fan, this is what you've been waiting for. All right. Awesome. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I got to talk to him about it when I, you know, set something up and. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that? Well, he's thank wonderful. you so much. Thank you so yeah, much. For your time. Really pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for everything you've done for me in the past. I can't thank you. Right. And I'll see you in December, not January. December 14th. I will see you. All right, brother. Thank you. All right. Take it easy. Bye-bye.